It's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jeannie DiClemente, who's going to talk to us on um, HIV risk and uh, substance abuse. Um, give you a little bit of background about Dr. DiClemente's work. She's worked in the substance abuse field and HIV field since the mid-1980s. Um, as a master's level clinician, she worked in a variety of settings, including inpatient, outpatient, and residential treatment facilities. Um, in her doctoral program, Dr. DiClemente worked at the University of Denver um, in training in clinical work in HIV AIDS and um, continued doing this work in her clinical psychology internship at Cook County Hospital in Chicago. And there she worked in an outpatient HIV clinic and the inpatient AIDS ward. Uh, she subsequently began her research in clinical health psychology, which she's still doing today, and publishes in both psychology journals and medical journals. Um, the intersection of substance abuse and HIV uh, has been well documented, and Dr. DiClemente's work is uh, related to her background in both of these fields. She is also a regional trainer for the American Psychological Association's HIV Office of Psychology Education, which is known as HOPE, uh, the HOPE program. And she also conducts trainings and consultation services for mental health professionals who work with people with HIV or substance abuse disorders. So I'm sure you'll enjoy her talk, and I'll turn it over to Dr. DiClemente. Thank you, Dr. Lawton, for that wonderful introduction that I wrote. Um, <laughs> okay, louder? Okay, I'm getting the louder, so I'll step forward, turn up the mic. How's that? Okay, good. I have a cohort in the back that are going to signal me, which is what I'm kind of afraid of. Anyway, um, let, me, let me start off uh, by saying that, uh, point out, first of all, my clicker's not going to work. Um, I've got some show and tell on the table here. If you, you may have seen them when you filed in, I'll leave them up for uh, when, you, when you leave. But what I have um, is a collection of things that I use when I work either with clients that I'm seeing as a clinician, when I'm doing outreach work in the community, when I am doing work with research participants. And um, on one side of the table, I have the assortment of condoms and lube. Um, the kind of lube that you want to use, you know, we all know that there are lubes that you can use and lubes that you cannot use with condoms, um, and uh, instructions on how to use a condom. And on the other side of the table next to it, I have a collection of items you can find in any household um, for protecting yourself if you are an injection drug user. Um, most, many health departments, and I uh, actually have a picture here, many health departments actually have professionally prepared um, bleach kits for drug injection users, um, but the, that varies from state to state depending on the paraphernalia laws. And um, I, I didn't want to violate, it would be embarrassing to be arrested in the middle of my talk. You know, um, but, and most people, many people do not have access to these professionally prepared kits anyway. So what I have here on the table is I have, I have a bottle of water, um, I have some generic bleach, cotton balls, um, I have a, uh, an insulin syringe, which is a very, very popular, one of the most popular syringes for use with in injection drugs. I have um, some surgical gloves, I have a spoon, cotton balls, uh, and a bottle cap, and all of these are meant to, um, it's very, very similar to what you see in the kit, um, and what I explain is that um, you use the bleach and water, a mixture of 10 to 1. Uh, HIV is a very, very fragile virus, and it only takes a solution of 10 to 1, 10 parts water to 1 part bleach, to kill the virus um, in injection equipment. And so I give the instructions on how to protect themselves. Um, also included here are, uh, we also have dental dams, which are for use with, with oral sex. Um, and what I don't have, um, I, couldn't, I couldn't find it. I actually have a, 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 a female condom. This is a female condom or a windsock. Uh, um, they're, they're, they're actually rather cumbersome. 
Um, and I, I have it tucked away safely along with some other items that uh, we have little ones in the house now and I have this fear of a interesting kindergarten show and tell so we keep those things tucked away uh, but this is a this is a uh, this is a female condom and to give you an example of um, sort of the size and the uh, configuration of the female condom uh, these were developed in Europe quite a number of years ago they were finally it took five or six maybe five or six years before uh, they were finally licensed in the United States where you could actually sell them in the United States they're rather expensive they're very unwieldy but they, uh, they also can be effective in preventing transmission of, um, of sexually transmitted infections as well as, as well as preventing pregnancy. Okay, um, as, as uh, when, cause Carol introduced me and as I have found over the years, um, and, and that I think that we all know is that there is, there is a major intersection between HIV risk and substance use on a couple of different, uh, in a couple of different ways. Um, first of all, uh, as I've alluded to, in terms of injection drug equipment, sharing injection equipment, um, not just sharing needles by the way. People think that the only way that you can get HIV from another person is if you just share the needle. But research has shown that there are dozens of ways in the whole injection, injection drug process in which you can transmit HIV. For example, if you are sharing the liquid, if you are sharing the drug, and you use a dirty needle to mix the solution, you mix the drug, dissolve the drug in water, and you use a dirty needle, you may have enough bio burden in the solution to transmit HIV to the other party, even though they may be using a clean needle. If they draw it out of that contaminated fluid, they're exposed to HIV. <laughs> People use cotton balls to, as, a, uh, as a filter so that they don't clog when they're drawing the solution up into their syringe. They use the cotton balls to, um, to filter out any, any undissolved material. That cotton ball can hold um, HIV, HIV in, in very, very microscopic drops of fluid uh, long enough to infect somebody else. So it's not just the needle. Um, and it's also not necessarily just injection drug users, meaning street drugs, that, are, um, that transmit HIV to each other. In large area, in areas of the country where there are large populations, for example, of seasonal workers. Now, I'm from Colorado. In the San Luis Valley of Colorado, there we have, it's, it's a very large population of seasonal workers that come through um, to pick the crops. And, um, very often because the hours are very, very long, um, the work is very, very hard, they get injectable vitamins. They're given injectable vitamins. All it takes is one HIV positive person in that community and they're sharing needles and they're injecting something that's completely legal. So it's not just illegal street drugs, okay. The other, uh, of course, the other way of transmitting HIV, as we all know, um, in, terms of the, in terms of a substance use population, um, is through risky sexual behaviors. And um, even for the non-injecting drug user, and I'm going to talk mostly about non-injecting drug user today, uh, people tend to have multiple sexual partners, they tend to engage in unsafe sexual practices, um, and they engage in what we refer to as transactional sex, meaning they're trading sex for something. They may be trading sex for drugs, they may be trading sex for money, but they also may very well be trading sex for a place to live or to put food on the table. Okay, all of that, which um, which are legitimate reasons, but the, the methods for you know the, obviously the method of transaction is something that that um, that uh, causes them problems. Okay, methamphetamine is um, I. I started to say my drug of choice, but that probably could be misconstrued. Uh, my drug of interest, and, okay, in, in terms of research, all right. Um, methamphetamine, just briefly, is a very, very powerful central nervous system stimulant that uh, you make from household chemicals. And if you've, um, you know, if you've ever been to the store in the last couple of years and tried to buy Sudafed, um, you know that that's one of the, that's a major ingredient in, um, in uh, methamphetamine. This, um, this increases um, stimulation of um, uh, neurotransmitter receptors in the central nervous system. 
It was uh, first synthesized in 1893. It can be injected, it can be smoked, it can be ingested <coughs> orally, it can be snorted. Um, when smoked or inje injected, the effects are immediate. Um, it takes, after eating or snorting, it takes a few minutes. Um, it results in extreme autonomic arousal. I mean, extreme. Um, think about think about the day that you had six cups of coffee and what it felt like when the caffeine kicked in. Multiply that by maybe a hundred times. It is it is an enormous arousal, and there are people who derive extreme pleasure from that enormous arousal. Some of the long-term effects are definitely structural changes in pathways in, in the central nervous system, damage to neurons. It is estimated that only after only 10 days of use, it can take, it can take over two years for neurotransmitter production to recover. 10 days takes two years to recover, and that's a, that's a minimum. Um, some of the effects are irritability, paranoia, anxiety, insomnia, um, all, of, all of the symptoms of extreme autonomic arousal. Um, you may have heard of meth mouth. Um, there are, uh, you can actually find, you can actually find a lot of information in the dental journals about methamphetamine use because it destroys the tissue in the mouth. Um, um, it destroys gum tissue, it destroys the enamel. Um, people will, um, you'll be, I'll be talking to people, I got, I've just gotten used to talking to people who had no teeth or their teeth are very, very loose and they will describe that their teeth would just spontaneously <clears throat> fall out. They'll just be sitting there one day and a tooth will just suddenly fall out because the, uh, the gum tissue is so damaged. Um, the, um, other deficits, there are deficits in neuropsychological functioning, um, long-term deficits, there are immediate deficits, um, and there are long-term deficits, obviously impairment in memory, um, <coughs> executive function, and I'm going to show you a model in a little bit of, um, uh, that was uh, published this year by a colleague of mine in the HOPE program um, that talks about how use of meth can result in impaired executive functioning. Um, I, my, my personal model is that I think there is some disruption in executive functioning prior to starting the math, and we'll talk about that here in a little bit. Uh, attention concentration, speed of information processing. Um, I have interviewed people who are, who are active meth users but not currently high. Um, they're very, very slow. Um, you know, it takes them a while to process a question I would ask. I've also, I've also interviewed people who are currently high on meth, and it's a, it's a whole different, um, you know, we're, we're talking a different, different RPMs <laughs> um, when you're interviewing somebody who is currently, who is currently high. Um, and they have um, difficulty in, in inhibiting impulsive behaviors. You know, we all, we all um, and this is, I think, primarily frontal lobe functioning, we are able to inhibit impulsive behaviors. You want to take that cookie, but you can stop yourself. Um, there's a significant disruption in the ability to inhibit behavior in persons who are, uh, who are methamphetamine users. Now, just briefly, where are the labs? Well, in 1999, um, this is from the uh, United States Department of Justice. In 1999, and uh, as a visual aid, I circled where the bulk of the labs were found, um, primarily on, on the West Coast, although we're starting to, we were starting to see in 1999 a trend toward the Midwest. Um, over, the, uh, over the next few years, we see a movement from the West Coast um, inland um, until by, by about the mid-2000s, 2004, you can see where the bulk of the labs. Now, these statistics are underestimates of the actual number of labs. These are just meth lab incidents. That these are labs that have been busted by the police. That these statistics from you are the, from the Department of Justice. So, if you if you look here in 2004, in the state of Indiana alone, there were 1,074 clandestine laboratory incidents um, in the state of Indiana. That is not all of the labs that were in the state of Indiana. That's a thousand of them that got caught. It's, it's, we can't even estimate how many more were not caught. Um, 
we're, we're actually fortunate. The Indiana State Police has a, probably one of the better uh, meth, meth lab task force of uh, police departments in the, in the country, and they made a very concerted effort to bust these labs. Um, so as we, as we proceed to um, calendar year 2008, which is the, the last time we have these numbers for, you can see that the numbers have, have settled down and they're remaining fairly stable. Um, another way we can look at it, just for the state of Indiana, you see the dramatic increases in, in the early part of this century. Um, it pe seemed to peak in 2004, but it's still it is still remaining somewhat somewhat stable. It seems to have stabilized here. This last bar is 2008. And so I would, I would predict that this year and next year it's probably going to be somewhere in that, in that same range. Indiana is a prime place for methamphetamine labs. Of the 33,000, almost 34,000 square uh, miles, uh, well, we have almost 34,000 square miles of rural area compared to a little over 2,000 square miles that are, that are considered urban. We, Fort Wayne is considered urban. Uh, Indianapolis, obviously, uh, Gary, uh, Terre Haute is even considered urban. Um, and, uh, but everything else in between, if, if, if you notice those, there are, there are miles and miles and miles, if you were to look at a map of Indiana, miles and miles and miles of blank space in between those cities. Uh, those were where we find a lot of the labs, 95% um, of them, as a matter of fact. Um, it, they, um, early on, also, the primary labs, the focus of the labs and methamphetamine import and production was focused along the southwestern border of the state where it borders, uh, where it borders with Illinois, down in Vigo County, uh, from Terre Haute down toward in the Evansville direction. In the last few years, though, the bulk of meth production and um, in importing, if you will, has shifted from southwest to our neck of the woods, to northeast Indiana. We're, uh, we're, we're pretty, uh, pretty prime. I think I have it uh, here somewhere. Um, we're pretty prime. We're, we are intersected by a number of major highways. Um, it's easy enough to get to Chicago. We've got um, we've got I-69 north south. We've got we've got the Turnpike up north of us. Um, it's it's an easy trip to get into into Michigan into over into Chicago. Um, we do have some we do have some airports, um, and so we are a we are a in a actually a perfect situation for um, importing and exporting methamphetamine. Um, <clears throat> Mexican drug traffic organizations, that, that as a source of meth has, um, has slowed down due to increased restrictions on the border. Um, but, but, so most of the meth currently that's being imported and exported um, is by cars and trucking um, through the major highways and airports. Um, the super labs, uh, we, we're seeing a decline in super labs run by these major trafficking organizations, but we're seeing, a, we're seeing an increase in the small individual mom and pop labs. Somebody has a lab out in their barn or in their garage or in their apartment. Um, and uh, also the one pot method or called the shake and bake method. Um, which involves fewer ingredients. You can do it in a one liter plastic um, soda bottle, um, and you can do it in a car. So one person drives while the other, honey, you drive, I'll cook. Okay. Um, the other, the other, the bad part about this, and this is this has been in the news recently, is they also make it also makes a weapon. So when they are stopped by the police, their first instinct is to throw this bottle full of chemicals at the police officer, and that can result in really, really severe chemical burns. Um, and then there's a there's a, a another little thing called smurfing. Okay, you probably think of little blue characters when you hear the word smurfing, right? Has anybody heard of this term smurfing related to drug use? Well, the next time you're at Walgreens or CVS or you know one of the major pharmacies in town and you see a van pull up and several people get out of the van and go marching into the pharmacy, go down the pharmacy aisles. And they each grab, they go up and they each get their two packages of Sudafed. Um, they, and if you watch long enough, they will go back and they will all get back in the same van. 
What the drug manufacturers are doing, though, the people who have run the labs, is they're getting they're getting um, homeless people, people who are down on their luck and, and need a few need, need a few dollars, or they want some drug, and they get them. They co get a collection of them to go in and hit the pharmacies for their maximum allotted Sudafed. Go back out in the van. They make the trade, and now we've got enough Sudafed to make the meth with. Okay, that's what smurfing is. Um, I have, um, again, I have alluded to this, uh, that we're intersected by a lot of interstate and intrastate roads. There's a lot of open areas, outbuildings and barns, and it's, um, it's easy to conceal methamphetamine production. Um, actually, we were, uh, my family and I were driving down to, uh, over to western, uh, western Indiana one day. We were going, I think, near Plainfield. Uh, no, outside of Plainfield in, so in, a, in a very rural area west of Indianapolis, and all of a sudden you could smell, we were out in the middle of what I thought was, I grew up in the city, so I consider this all out in the middle of nowhere. I mean, there, you know, towns are few and far between. We were somewhere between <coughs> Plainfield and I think Terre Haute uh, along I-70, and all of a sudden, uh, all of a sudden you smell this really, really awful, that's a meth lab. And it was out somewhere in one of the, there were very few, but it was one of the buildings out in the field. So if you're ever driving out in the country here and you smell that, it's, it's unmistakable and you, you may not know what it is, but it's nothing like you've ever smelled. That's probably, you're probably smelling a meth lab. Um, <clears throat> the uh, number of labs um, has remained consistently high. Um, this is obviously an underestimate of the actual number of labs that are in production at any given time. And Indiana has the dubious distinction of having been in the top 10 for a number of labs seized in the past four years. Um, another indicator uh, also of meth use in the state are the drug treatment admissions for uh, methamphetamine. And um, you can see that there's a, it, it's the three years that for which we have statistics, it ranges between 5% and 6% of all drug admissions are for methamphetamine. This is a dramatic rise over the first part of this decade, by the way. Um, and that it's evenly split between males and females, interestingly enough. It's evenly split. Um, it's, not a, it's not a man's drug or it's not a woman's drug. And just if I don't have your attention by now, um, this, uh, this, we have a couple of before and after pictures here. Um, after just a few months of use of methamphetamine. And then here's an example. Uh, I, got these, I got these from a dental journal of examples of uh, the deterioration that occurs um, in a person's mouth from um, smoking meth. Okay, now we're going to talk, now I'm going to talk about HIV, give you the introduction to HIV, and then I'll get into talking about uh, my, own, my own research. Um, the former, formerly, it had been estimated um, that there were about 40,000 new HIV infections in the United States every year. Recently, within, the, within the, the last few months, the CDC and the NIH um, revised those estimates upwards to about 56,000 new infections every year. So. From the year that this, these statistics are from 2006, which is the, and, and to, to, to explain the, the, how long it takes for the government to make the stats public, these came out two days ago. Okay, I got this slide set two days ago from the CDC, but these are 2006 statistics. Um, we see that um, HIV incidence um, uh, is, disproportionately effect, is a disproportionately affecting the African American community. Although the African American community accounts for about 12% of the general population, um, they account for about half of all new infections. Um, followed by white European, persons of European descent, um, persons, and then persons of Hispanic or Latino descent um, make, the bulk, make up the bulk of the, the new HIV infections. Um, among heterosexual incidents, um, we see the, the division between males and females are pretty much, 
pretty much the same across the three major ethnic and racial groups. Um, for every, uh, it's about two to one women are being infected in this country at about uh, heterosexuals, about a rate of two to one women to men. Um, there are some reasons for that. Um, women are uh, women are more vulnerable to HIV infection for a couple of reasons. One, they are biologically more vulnerable because they are women are receptacles for quantities of body fluid. They are socially uh, they're socially vulnerable because women are not always in a position to dictate safer sex practices when in a when in a heterosexual relationship and women are also more likely to be uh, the victims of sexual violence in, in relate whether in a relationship or not um, and so these statistics really aren't surprising um, to see um, intravenous drug use um, by race this these are these are uh, people who acquired HIV through intravenous drug use um, we see again African Americans are at 63 percent, and the remaining is divided primarily between white of European descent and um, the Hispanic population. Um, and we then also see what's once again it's a little more evenly divided uh, for uh, African Americans and and uh, white persons, and um, still about at about two to one male to female ratio for intravenous transmission among uh, Hispanic or Latinos, um, intravenous transmission of HIV. And then um, men who have sex with men, whether or not they identify as gay, we don't, we don't use that anymore. We talk about men who have sex with men. Um, and we see that it's uh, uh, actually uh, white men who have sex with men, um, uh, the bulk of um, the infections are, go, are uh, among white men. And HIV in Indiana. HIV in Indiana reflects the national trends. Um, we see uh, that it is about in about the same uh, similar proportions. We see the prevalence rates. Look at these prevalence rates. Um, this, I mean, does this tell you that the African American community is very is being very much disproportionately affected by? Uh, HIV as well as the, uh, the Latino community. Um, almost not quite 92 percent um, per 100, or 92 people per 100,000, 170, almost 180 for Hispanics, Latinos, and 531 and a half for um, African Americans. Um, other sexually transmitted infections, um, we see, um, I think uh, chlamydia is the big winner here. Um, where we see very high rates. Um, Marion County in Indianapolis uh, a couple of years ago had the dubious <coughs> distinction of being the number one county in the country for rates of syphilis. Um, it, 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 had, it beat everybody by very, very large numbers. Um, sexually transmitted infections are important to track because they're very definitely a very strong indicator of um, unprotected sexual practices. And even though you know the the numbers here are very different, uh, we see many, 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 many more people with other sexually transmitted infections. Um, we, I think, one of the things we need to think about is how many, how much of this is hiding HIV? How many of these people they've clearly been exposed to HIV because they're having unprotected sex? And so uh, the rates of HIV infection in the state of Indiana, if you take a look at the rates of sexually transmitted infections, you have to, you have to think that the rates of uh, HIV infection are significantly underreported. Okay. <clears throat> Meth use and risky sex, same, those, they go together very much so, very hand in hand. Uh, meth increases the likelihood of unprotected sexual contact, um, and it particularly penetrative sex, uh, oral penetration, vaginal or anal penetration. Um, heterosexual women, and there, there's a lot of research out there that has shown this time and time again, heterosexual women are more likely, uh, that are using meth, are more likely to engage in receptive anal sex and less likely to use condoms. Um, the, uh, the links are um, a number of 
uh, characteristics associated with the individual, but also the major link is just simply using methamphetamine. Um, we see impulsivity. Um, there's a body of literature on impulsivity and poor impulse control um, as, um, I think I get to sensation seeking here a little bit later, um, but which is linked to a number of, a number of disorders such as uh, attention deficit disorder, substance abuse, uh, pathological uh, gambling, certain personality disorders, uh, but it's also and and the components of impulsivity occur in, um, include a sense of urgency, getting things done right now. I have to have it done. I can't wait. Um, reward sensitivity. Uh, they're very 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 particularly sensitive to reinforcement um, and being very very rash, behaving very rashly. Um, there there's some research that it says that. Um, Again, meth breaks down your ability to inhibit impulsive behaviors, but um, there's also a, we also have to consider that the person who is impulsive uh, has poor planning, poor judgment. May also that also is a setup for using um, a drug like methamphetamine. Perry Halkidis, um just this year, he this his uh, his book um, came out just this year. Perry is a colleague of mine in the uh, in the Hope program. Um, proposed this model uh, relating meth use to risky sexual behaviors. Um, we meth use resulting in um, certain um, dis certain um, types of damage to neurons, um, both the structure and the function of neurons, which then will damage and, and along certain pathways, which will damage executive functioning, um, also social functioning. Um, and those, those in turn then can lead to risky sexual behavior. Um, I'm, I would propose that the uh, disruptions in executive function and social cognitive function then also, um, also it would be a precursor or would also predict methamphetamine use among certain segments of the population. Um, and that's, that's what I have in my, in my research I am working on. Um, uh, trying to figure out, we're looking at the direction of the relationships, in other words. Um, we see a lot of um, impulsivity. Um, we see impulsivity uh, occurring people with high levels of impulsivity, and there are a number of measures in which we can actually measure somebody's level of impulsivity. Um, but the relationship between unprotected sex and uh, how much meth they're using and how frequently they're using meth seems to be strongest among those persons who are very impulsive. Um, we see uh, some reports of heightened sex drive and levels of desire among female meth users, although I have data here in a little bit that uh, actually would contradict that. Um, and we see, uh, again, more and more research, female users, particularly injecting users, increase in unprotected anal sex and multiple sexual partners. Um, Halkidis also reported a number of studies that, 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 that uh, supported the notion that uh, people who use meth are more likely to engage in casual or anonymous sexual contacts. Um, and including one study, female meth users um, using meth to, um, to try to lose weight. Um, I, uh, and the feelings of attractiveness, although, you know, the earlier slide would would, would seem to not support that, the feeling, feelings of attractiveness as a result of the weight loss, plus this euphoria from the high, um, may result in sexual promiscuity. There are also a number of underlying personality characteristics that drive the risk taking, uh, that drive the use of the drug for sexual enhancement. We see this in particular in the uh, population of men who have sex with men. Um, and in the and, and meth as uh, as used as a club drug in the clubs um, in the in the larger urban areas, but we're also seeing it more and more among heterosexual users in um, you know in, in sort of the rural Midwest. Um, Nina pr proposed lower levels of self-esteem. Halkidis uh, actually proposed undiagnosed ADHD in adults as maybe being related to meth use. And if you think about the fact that. What, what do we use to treat children or, or adolescents or adults with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder? 
What do we use? We use amphetamines. We use not for the stimulant value of the drug, but for the way the effect that the drug has on organizing certain neural pathways in the frontal lobe, and that this actually may serve to help organize people. I mean, I have talked to a certain percentage of people who said they were able to get things done. Um, they couldn't describe it any better than that, but you could almost infer that they may feel more focused and organized and certainly needed less sleep. And then sensation seeking um, as an additional as an additional link, and I'm, I'm, I'm not going to go through this because I want to get to, I want to get to my, my research here. Um, but sensation seeking as another link between um, between or another predictor of methamphetamine use and risky sexual behavior. Okay, now um, I have I have done. I'm going to talk about some different types of studies that I have done here in here in Fort Wayne. Um, at IPFW uh, the, along the lines of drug use and also HIV, HIV AIDS awareness and prevention um, and risky behavior. Um, just so you all know, these were all approved by the IRB, um, although they were tough on me. Um, and um, we, we actually, uh, uh, we hold each other to a higher standard, by the way, just some of you researchers in the room, I just want you to know that we hold each other to a higher standard. Um, so that nobody, uh, there's, there's no suspicion that we took advantage of our positions. <coughs> um, I um, did, uh, did a study, uh, this is a, I'm not even going to read this to you, but um, I did a, recently did a study on the use of different types of educational material to educate college students about safer sex practices and HIV. Um, one of the things that, <clears throat> that we're aware of is that people just, people give out information. The typical HIV education program is to hand out information. Here, have a pamphlet. Here, attend this talk. Here, read this article. Listen to this lecture by this doctor. But nobody, nobody has followed up to see that if it actually results in behavior change. Um, on, at the same time, people continue to use these methods for educating college students and, uh, and other adults and high school students about, um, about HIV and so forth. But there's no attitude or behavior measurement to see if there, anything has, has, has changed. So what we did was we, um, we had two videos. We, we had a video of a, of a lecture by a physician on the dangers of risky sex and on HIV. And we then, in, the, in another condition, we had a video of a series of interviews with people who uh, were eight, living with HIV, um, who had acquired HIV through some risky practices, and who were just simply talking about what it was like to find out they were positive, what it was like, what it did to their relationships, um, and so forth. We showed these. We measured attitudes towards AIDS. And, and HIV and knowledge of HIV and AIDS before they saw the video, and then we measured it afterwards. We um, we also gave them um, we also gave them postcards to mail back in. They were redeemable for three free condoms. Um, these were not this was not compensation for participating, but this was a, this, we thought this would be a good measure of behavior change to see if people would make the effort to get condoms after seeing the videos. Um, not that many people did. We had, uh, uh, I'm trying to remember how many, how many students we, uh, the numbers are here on another slide, uh, but we only had maybe maybe three or four dozen people uh, send their postcards back in. So it wasn't necessarily a good, but it was a nice thought. Um, they, uh, they, we assessed their attitudes towards AIDS, as I said, um, self-report of condom use uh, and other risk behaviors, and we measured that at a minimum of two weeks following having them into the lab. Um, uh, okay, we, at, this, at the point that I did this, we had not quite 300 participants, um, and actually 211 followed up, which is not a not a bad return rate. To, uh, although you know, you, you guys, students here, you know what you do for credit for class, so you know those Psych 120 classes. Um, they were um, here's how here's how they were divided into into the two groups, and what we found was. We found actually a main effect for a video. I'm not, don't even bother to read this. We found a main effect for the video 
on the follow-up on the attitudes towards AIDS, as well as self-report of condom use. Um, we found that the women in our sample had significantly more positive attitudes towards AIDS at the beginning. Now this was kind of an interesting, this was kind of an interesting result. They had a significantly more positive attitude toward AIDS at the beginning of the um, study. Um, that dropped by the time they saw the video. The men had a, had a less positive attitude toward AIDS at the beginning of the study, but that actually improved by the time they had seen the video. We also, um, we also saw that knowledge um, about HIV uh, predicted positive responses to the video. In other words, people who already knew had already had a pretty good knowledge base about HIV and then watched the video, we then saw a, a, a positive increase in their attitudes toward HIV um, than people who had less knowledge um, about the video. We also saw a positive increase in self-report of condom use, um, a significant positive increase from pre-video to post-video. Um, now there could be a, I mean there, there could be social desirability playing in there of course uh, because I think by the time you see the video you know you're supposed to use condoms um, but I'd like to think that maybe maybe somewhere if they know they're supposed to use condoms they're supposed to report it maybe they really are using condoms. Okay. Um, now we following up with that then um, I had a, a group a group of students uh, we did a, a survey on campus of college students drug use. Um, we surveyed people. Um, they had it was a it was a convenience sample. Um, I had students all over campus with little clipboards. Hi, would you like to talk about drugs? And we we surveyed uh, college drug use. And I I'm I'm just gonna I'm just gonna show you a, a little bit um, just just some of the numbers of people who endorsed using using drugs. Um, we had out of a what did I say my sample size was 560 respondents. Nearly all of them, 95% reported they had used alcohol. 11%, um, which is a, that's, that's not an insignificant number, were currently using methamphetamines or amphetamines. Um, we had a 3%, you know, 56% using, um, using marijuana. This was all assessing current use um, and uh, so forth. And then we asked them a series of questions about drug-related behaviors and um, the ones that were um, the ones that were uh, of most interest, of course, of me was the, to me was the, the percentage of people who had sex under the influence of drugs, 42 percent, um, but 66 percent had never gotten tested for HIV. Okay, those are the those are the two big ones that, that that I was that I was mostly interested in. So we've got nearly half nearly half of our sample. Had had sex while under the influence of drugs, and nobody um, nobody had ever been un, un, I'm sorry unprotected sex under the influence of drugs, and nobody had ever two thirds of them had never been tested for HIV. Um, I, that's um, I think that speaks. I we got a couple of student affairs people here that speaks to some programming maybe on uh, that we why we want to talk about on, on campus. Okay. Then my big, my big community uh, methamphetamine study. Um, I, I, first of all, let me, let me I'll give you a little background on, on doing this. I had to, uh, I started doing some research, started making phone calls about where I would find methamphetamine users um, around Fort Wayne and, you know, out in Allen County. And um, so I called uh, all the agencies I could think of to, uh, to find out where to, where to get started. <laughs> You know where I got started? Back here on campus. My initial contact, my initial contact into the meth use the currently using active methamphetamine community was on this campus, um, and it was a matter of having that person participate in the sending flyers, and then it then it just snowballed. I mean, literally snowball sampling. Sampling that was a, that's a really good word for the sampling. Um, but I had called all all these agencies, and I was assured time and time again by more and more people that there was not a methamphetamine problem in the city of Fort Wayne, that I will never find a meth user in the city of Fort Wayne, okay? Uh, that I'm going to have to go to Noble County. Uh, I'm going to have to go up northeast or up farther north 
to find methamphetamine users. I was prepared to do that. I had contacts in these other counties that I was prepared to do that. I never left Fort Wayne. I had, I got all of my data from people living around <coughs> Fort Wayne. Um, we had a sample of 50 uh, active, the active meth users, uh, 46 of them. There were four people that slipped in under the wire. Um, somebody, somebody was trying to take care of a friend. Well, tell her, tell her you use meth and she'll give you some money. Uh, but then by the time they got to me, they were honest about it. Well, no, I don't use it. But I, it was, I got some interesting data anyway. Um, we, we did use informed consent, and by signing the consent form, they were admitting to using meth. Okay, they were being at least being associated with using meth. Um, so I went to the NIH and got a certificate of confidentiality, which uh, could be used to, um, to defend against any attempt to subpoena any of the research data. Uh, which the research data wouldn't necessarily have been useful anyway because it would, I separated consent forms from actual questionnaire data and so forth. So, uh, but it's an extra added, it's an extra added cushion, and it also made the the participants feel secure. I could show them a letter from the federal government, um, and it, it made them feel better. Um, we we did a detailed questionnaire. Um, that asked about their drug use history, asked about their sexual behaviors, um, including um, heterosexual sexual behaviors, same-sex sexual behaviors, um, a lot of risky sexual behaviors. Um, we, we gave them some measures of sensation seeking and impulsivity. Um, they, they completed the questionnaires and they participated in either a focus group if we had, you know, if we had a group of them together, and that happened a few times. Um, or if they were more comfortable in doing an individual interview, um, we also then we would also accommodate that. Um, we had 28 males, 22 females, um, and here's here's where my sample is different from the samples you see in many of the other studies. 62% um, of my of, of my participants were uh, black or African. Identified as black or African American. And most of the studies on meth use, particularly in the Midwest, you see most of them say that it is pri it, their, their samples are primarily white, white persons of European descent. Um, and so my sample is a little is a little bit different. Um, we had 28 percent were white. Um, um, we had two persons who were Hispanic Latino, and then two identified as as biracial. 78% of them were unemployed. And, you know, I think it's probably no accident that, uh, and I've been thinking this since I collected these data, no accident that the, some of the highest rates of methamphetamine use are found in the area of Indiana that has the highest, some of the highest unemployment rates, such as the Elkhart area. Um, and so that's just, that's just something I'm keeping in the back of my mind for my next round of, uh, my next round of interviews. Uh, we had some, some people, who, seven were employed part-time, uh, we only had one person that was employed full-time, um, and actually, he called himself a full-time employee, he was running a meth lab, and he considered that full-time employment. Um, who was I to, you know, argue with that? Um, of course, all of them consistent with all the research on impulsivity and sensation-seeking, all of them were uh, well above the norm, well in excess of any of the norms. Um, Mean age of 41, 41.36 uh, years, so we had a slightly old, this, these are not college age, college age people by any means. Um, average number of years of meth use was six years, average number of drug partners was two and a half. Uh, we had, we, we had almost, we had almost no people who did it, who did it alone, who did meth alone. Um, m nearly all, with the exception of two of the African American women, all of the other African American women called meth a white man's drug and reported that they had been introduced to methamphetamine by white males. Um, one one uh, woman, this is a direct quote, it was this white guy who introduced me to it. Another woman we interviewed said, not being racist, but white people, white people did that meth and I got it from my boyfriend and her boyfriend was white. Nearly all of the women expressed a desire to kick it. Um, and, and three of them thought that three of them were told they were smoking crack, and actually somebody slipped them meth. Um, three of the women during the course of the interview, because we, we paid them money for participating, we comp compensated them. 
they reported that they were going to stop at the grocery store on the way home so that they could get milk for their babies before their boyfriends took the money and spent it on drugs. Um, the women reported having sex while high. Every one of them had sex while high, unprotected sex. Most of them reported they didn't want to have sex while high, but they felt they felt trapped to having sex. Um, and two of the women used together, they'd smoke during the day and they'd stop in enough time to get the kids from home from school. So they'd send the kids off to school, they would, uh, they would smoke, uh, smoke their meth all day, and then they would stop in time for the kids to get off the bus. Here's our, uh, our full-time uh, meth lab guy, our full-time employed guy. He's using his degree in chemistry. I didn't ask him where he got it. I didn't want to know. Um, most of the males were introduced by peers. Um, they, um, the, the women were introduced by boyfriends um, and feeling like they were in sort of a power down position and they kind of sort of had to use it. Um, the males, though, reported they were, they'd been smoking pot with their friends, playing cards, or drinking beer on the porch, and somebody said, hey, I got something you want to try it. And it was, it was in, a, in a situation that was with their friends. Um, when um, I asked how long it would take if they were to walk out of the room, where we were meeting, if they were to walk out of the room and went out and looked for methamphetamine, how long would it take them to find some? And the estimates didn't get over two hours. Uh, but they range from 10 minutes to two hours. And part of it depended on what part of the city uh, we were interviewing in. Okay. Um, we have years of use, uh, again, ranging um, from uh, you know, a mean of 8.9 for uh, African American females uh, down to uh, you know, maybe one year of use. So anywhere between one and uh, almost nine years of use. <coughs> One person in the mix, um, out of 50, one person reported knowing uh, about being HIV positive. Ten have never been tested. Um, four reported that we had history of syphilis, history of gonorrhea, chlamydia, trichomoniasis, and unwanted pregnancies, um, all as indirect results of um, unprotected sexual behaviors. We had a fourth of them um, had engaged in transactional sex. Um, 17 female respondents had a cumulative total of 55 male sexual partners. Three had a total of 11 um, female sexual partners. And uh, 26 males reported a cumulative total of 163 female sexual partners. Drug partners. The males reported a cumulative total of 53 drug partners. So the males were more likely to the males were more likely to get high with somebody else. Um, although the, the females, um, the females reported a total of 44 drug partners. Um, again, this this ranged anywhere from from zero on up. Now, here's another interesting difference. Now, this would contradict what's been say, what has been said in other research. The men reported that they thought the meth enhanced their sexual performance. Not just experience, but their performance. It made them good. It made them last longer. It made them, it made, they thought they were good. And we asked them, were you really good? Or, and they, some, some of them would laugh and say, yeah, okay, I get that. We, that's why we thought we were good. That's why it was important. But the women, almost every single woman said that it actually interfered with their ability to, to enjoy sex, that they engaged in sex because they felt they had to or, uh, or for whatever reason, but if they didn't want to, that it actually killed the desire of law, they experienced a loss of libido from using the meth. Now, this may be, this may be just, a, a just something specific to my particular sample, um, but I, I'm certainly, I, it's certainly worth investigating again because this is very different than what a lot of the other research has said. So what am I going to do next, you may be asking. You know you're thinking, oh, does this mean she's almost done? Um, I'm presently, um, I actually have already have IRB approval um, for to get a larger, more rural sample. And I'm going to be heading into some of the more outlying counties, getting out of Fort Wayne. And of course, Noble County is definitely on my list. Um, I'm going to use a sampling technique called respondent-driven sampling. 
um, which is uh, which is a little bit different. What, what I had used before, you know, I I had gotten my uh, I'd gotten my contact from somebody who was on campus who knew somebody, etc. Um, and I ended up one of the one of the men that had responded to one of my had gotten one of my flyers had called me, and he then he kept bringing people to me. He would leave a message on my office phone. This is so and so. I've set an appointment for you for 2 o'clock Thursday with somebody at this location. I mean, I apparently had a research assistant out there in the street. Well, um, so, so what, what, I was so nice. Um, and, my, and our work study students, there were people that had my business card coming in off the street up to the psychology department asking for me. Um, so apparently the word got out, I, well, but you know, I had money. Um, Respondent driven sampling is a technique that's used to get into very, very hard to reach populations when you're interviewing, when you're interviewing sex workers on the street, for example, or active drug users. Um, you get an initial seed, that is, you get, you get an, an initial, you know, maybe two or three respondents that are going to participate in your study, and then you give them cards to hand out to six of their, six of their drug using friends, for example, six people they know, and you, for each person that successfully enrolls in the study, you pay the seed $10. And then for each of those people, you do the same thing. Um, and so they're actually, they're actually doing the recruiting. Now, let me tell you, for those of you that know, let me tell you how hard that was to get through the IRB, but I did get it through the IRB, okay? I know, I see, some, I see questions on your faces back there. Um, <clears throat> So I'm going to use respondent-driven sampling because that's a, that's a that's a really that's going to be the better way to get into the rural populations because they're going to be harder to reach than people in downtown Fort Wayne. Um, we're going one of the, the big things I want to do is assess decision-making abilities and interviewing for uh, comorbid psych disorders, specifically depression, uh, uh, ADHD. Um, PTSD, which is also being implied, and get a much more extensive employment um, and unemployment unemployment history. Um, I have a couple of big thank yous. Um, Mary Ross is sitting up here in front, who is the director of the IPFW Northeast Indiana Area Health Education Center. Um, and Robert Carlson, who is over at Wright State University, who helped me construct the original questionnaire I used, who is a, uh, he's actually an anthropologist, uh, but works over in the School of Medicine and is the director of their uh, Center for Excellence on Addictions uh, Research Intervention and Treatment. I had a boatload of research assistants. I had, uh, I had 30, 30 some odd research assistants. Um, and then I have one final announcement that I want to, uh, I want to tell everybody about. Um, Later in November, um, I've assembled a team, a team of people, uh, stu students taking my graduate level clinical psychology course and the mental health professionals um, at the, uh, the Counseling Center, the Student Assistance Program, and for free drug and alcohol screenings. So we're going to be doing this on Thursday, November 19th um, in the afternoon. Um, it's a chance to get a one-to-one one-to-one um, -one session with somebody to assess um, drug alcohol risk, find out the resources. Um, it'll be over in the wall. Um, we're, gonna, we're inviting all the campus community as well as the uh, Fort Wayne community at large to, um, to come in and uh, take this. Is, this is not research. This is just a service to the community um, for being so helpful with, uh, with conducting all this research. Um, and um, I do. One o'clock straight up. <laughs> Questions? There'll be a quiz later, you guys. <laughs> okay, thank you very much. <laughs>